Well, thank you very much to both Mark and Janet for those very kind words of introduction. And it's a real honour to have been invited here tonight to talk to you. And on this night of all nights, we didn't know when we fixed this, of course, that it was going to be quite this, uh, this sort of week. Uh, and I, of course, wrote most of this text uh, not knowing exactly how the last 72 hours, indeed the last 72 minutes, uh, have, uh, might have evolved. Uh, but my remarks, therefore, tonight are primarily about the lessons we need to learn from the last 30 months, although maybe it should be the last 30 years, uh, if we're to emerge from the other side of the Brexit process with both our democracy and our economy flourishing. The stakes, genuinely, in my view, couldn't be higher now. We face the biggest political crisis for at least a couple of generations. And the risk is that that morphs into a democratic crisis, a constitutional crisis, and an economic crisis. We just can't go on as we have been, evading and obfuscating choices, indeed frequently denying against all evidence uh, that there are unavoidable choices. And the public will understandably not, for a very long time, forgive a political class which on all sides of the divide fails to level with it on the choices that have to be made. So this feels rather an unseasonal theme, but as we're approaching Christmas, I thought I would therefore talk about nine lessons uh, that we need to draw from the last uh, two and a half years, uh, if the next two and a half aren't to be even more painful than uh, the last two and a half. The debate in this country, on all sides, I have to say, uh, continues to suffer from all manner of delusions, uh, fantasies and self-deception. And the debate in the EU on the British question, insofar as there is one, and there isn't much of one, suffers from complacency, uh, fatigue, and strategic myopia. We're in a bad way. And a descent into, I think, a deeply troubled and essentially conflictual relationship with the EU and a deeply divided British politics for the next generation becomes, I'm afraid, completely inevitable unless we learn these lessons and we apply that learning to the next few years. So these are the nine lessons as I see them. The first lesson, and I mean this not facetiously, well, not primarily facetiously anyway, um, is Brexit means Brexit. I mean that leaving the EU is genuinely a major regime change with massive political, legal, economic and social consequences. Being just outside the EU's outer perimeter fence, even if that's where we choose to be, and I rather doubt it, is not at all similar to being just inside the fence. And being just inside is, as I've said before in other lectures, where David Cameron sought to entrench the UK, outside political, monetary, banking, fiscal union, outside Schengen, and with a pick-and-choose approach to what used to be the third pillar of justice and home affairs. His was basically the last attempt to amplify and entrench British exceptionalism within the EU legal order. And he failed. A majority voted to leave altogether. And, and when they did, let's be honest, they were not told that at the end of the withdrawal phase of the negotiation there'd be another vote on whether they meant it or not now that they saw the terms. Maybe there should have been, but there wasn't. Incidentally, second vote campaigners seem either remarkably coy about whether they want to remain on the terms Cameron negotiated or whether some other new great offer will be forthcoming. I have to say, I don't think a new great offer would be forthcoming. If we stayed, though, contrary to what some allege, keeping, we would keep the existing membership terms. But once you leave the EU, you cannot, from outside the fence, achieve all the benefits you got when you were inside. First, there will, under no circumstances, no circumstances, be frictionless trade when outside the single market and customs union. Frictionless trade comes with free movement of people and with the European Court of Justice. More on that later. Secondly, voluntary alignment from outside, even where that makes sense or is just inevitable, does not deliver all the benefits of membership. Because unlike members, you're not subject to the adjudication and enforcement machinery to which all members are. And that's what Brexiteers wanted, right? Uh, British laws, British courts, fine. But then market access into what is now their market, the 27th market, governed by supranational laws and courts of which you are no longer part, and not as it used to be your market, is worse and more limited than it was before. And finally, the solidarity of the club members will always be with each other and not with you. We've seen that over the backstop issue over the last 18 months. The 27 systematically supported Dublin, not London. They still do. Nothing the Prime Minister now bids for will change that. 
this may be the first Anglo-Irish negotiation in our entire history where the greater leverage is not on London's side of the table. Well, just wait till the trade negotiations. The solidarity of the remaining member states will be with the fishing member states and not with the UK on the fish issue. The solidarity will be with Spain and not with the UK when Madrid makes Gibraltar-related demands in the trade negotiations endgame, which it will. The solidarity will be with Cyprus when it says it wants to avoid precedents that might be applied to Turkey. I could go on, and indeed on. Uh, the free trade agreement talks will be tougher than anything we've seen to date. Now, even now, UK politicians, including former Conservative leaders and foreign secretaries, really seem to think, they indeed write it, that if we just asserted ourselves a bit more aggressively in negotiations, we would have some typical multi-day, multi-night summit which would deliver some fundamentally different EU offer. But the EU is negotiating with us not as a member state, because we've chosen to leave, but as a prospective soon-to-be third country in the jargon of Brussels. So those glorious, sweaty, fudge-filled de Brussels denouements of European councils have gone. I've done more of those uh, Brussels European councils than any other Brit alive. The Prime Minister is not now in a negotiating room with the 27. She may get in there uh, this week for the first time. But that's not how the exit game works or how the trade negotiation works, and it, and it was never going to. And we do need urgently on all sides of the political spectrum, to start understanding how being a third country outside the EU is different. We are now a soon-to-be third country and an opponent and a rival and not just a partner. We have to get used to it. Second lesson. Other people have sovereignty too. Who knew? And they may choose to take back control of things you'd rather they didn't. Now, the sovereignist argument for Brexit, which was one powerful element of the referendum campaign, taking back control of laws, borders and money, is a perfectly legitimate case to make. If you think that the consequences of living in a block where the pooling of sovereignty has gone well beyond the technical regulatory domain into huge areas of public life is intolerable for democratic legitimacy and accountability, that's a more than honourable position. But others who've chosen to pull their sovereignty in ways and to extents which make you feel uncomfortable with the whole direction of their project have done so because they believe pooling of sovereignty enhances their sovereignty. Now, Brexit advocates may think this is a fundamental error and it's led to overreach by questionably accountable supranational institutions of their club. They may think it leads to legislation opaquely agreed by often completely unknown people which unduly favours heavyweight incumbent lobbyists. Fine, there's some justice in some of that. Well, then you leave the club. But you cannot, in the act of leaving a club, expect the club fundamentally to redesign its founding principles to suit you and share its sovereignty with you when it still suits you and to dilute their own agency in so doing. They're not going to do that. And both Her Majesty's government and Brexit advocates outside it seem constantly to find this frustrating and vexatious and some kind of indication of EU ill will. We've seen this in both former Brexit secretaries, conceptions of how deep mutual recognition agreements should be offered to the UK, alone of all third countries with which the EU deals. And in the initial propositions the government's put out on financial services, other services and data. We saw it with the really bizarre, total non-starter in my view, Schrodinger's customs union arrangement of the Prime Minister, where we got all the benefits of staying in the customs union while still leaving it and having a fully sovereign trade policy. But if by sovereignty we mean more than purely nominal decision-making power and we mean something genuine about the UK's, the projection of the UK's power in a world where autarky mercifully is not an option, then as we get into deeper trade, economic and security negotiations, we are going to need a far more serious debate about the trade-offs. And the trade-offs are real and difficult. No one should be pretending that the answers will all be great. To take one quite technical example, but it has fundamental implications for the economy and actually for national security. Cross-border data flows are completely central to free trade and prosperity. You wouldn't know it listening to the debate that we have on the, in this country at the moment on trade policy. The EU is a global player on data protection and data privacy. It's a global rule maker, able and willing effectively to impose its values, its rules and standards extraterritorially. Before the referendum, we had Brexit-supporting ministers and advisers, who frankly should have known better, 
fantasising about the autonomy we would have to plough our own furrow once sovereignty had been resumed and we were no longer obliged to live under the jackboot of the General Data Protection Regulation. Well, sobriety only started to set in in this debate after the referendum as the implication of the failure on the UK's part to achieve a so-called adequacy determination under the GDPR from the EU started to sink in because corporates from across a huge range of sectors started to lobby ministers and set out the implications. The same applies to so-called equivalence decisions in the jargon in masses of financial sector legislation, with which I spent too much of my career in the Treasury. Again, the consequences of failure to achieve such decisions will be the substantial erosion of market access into EU markets by UK companies. That's jobs and prosperity. What really are these equivalence and adequacy stories about? I know it's impenetrable jargon. They're the EU projecting power, and it does so quite well, uh, probably more effectively than Washington in multiple cr critical regulatory areas for the economy, and using its pooling of internal sovereignty to impose its values and standards well beyond its borders. Going global, unless it's a purely empty slogan in our politics, is precisely the ability to project both force and influence beyond one's own borders. Why does the current UK debate on sovereignty leave so many corporate players mystified and cold? Because in taking back control over our laws and leaving the adjudication and enforcement machinery of what used to be our home market, we're privileging rather notional autonomy over lawmaking, over real power to set the rules by which in practice we shall be governed. Since the massive costs of deviation from those rules will force large-scale UK compliance with rules set when we are no longer part of setting them. The EU will decide on sovereignty and sometimes on fiscal stability grounds that it's intolerable for certain kinds of activity to take place completely outside its jurisdiction. Now we may hate that, we may in many instances be right to hate it, it may be unnecessary, it may be unwise on the EU's part, but what from the outside are we going to be able to do about it? In the next few years, we're going to have to have these debates openly and seriously, or the public will soon conclude that much of the supposed control that they won back was just a simulacrum of sovereignty for some empty suits in Westminster, with the real decisions about their lives still being taken elsewhere. And that will not end well for some of the right honourable members for the 18th century. <laughs> Third lesson. Brexit is a process, not an event. And the EU, while strategically myopic, which I think I'm afraid it is, is formidably good at process against negotiating opponents. We have to be equally so, or we'll get hammered repeatedly. Now, in my view, you can't seriously advance the arguments that the EU has morphed away from the common market that we joined and got into every nook and cranny of UK life, eroding sovereignty across whole tracts of the economy and internal external security, and simultaneously say that we can extricate ourselves from all of that in a trice, recapture our sovereignty, rebuild the capability of the UK state to govern and regulate itself in vast areas where it's surrendered that sovereignty over the last 45 years. You can't have it both ways. The people saying three years ago that you could were, let's be candid, simply not serious. And they've proven not serious. They hadn't the slightest fag packet plan on what they were going to try and do and in which order when they took office. They made bold, confident assertions during the referendum and in many months after the referendum that we would have a fully-fledged trade deal with the EU ready and enforced by the day of our exit, and that not only that, rafts of further free trade deals with other fast-growing economies across the globe would be in place on the day after Brexit. These were risible claims when they were made, and they've now proven completely empty bluster. Likewise, all the breezy assertions that no deal would pose no great problems for aviation or for road haulage or for medicines or for food or for financial services or for data or for any number of other areas because, don't worry, WTO terms would kick in. No number of repetitions of the grossly misleading term WTO deal makes it any more real or effective. And its proponents, or at least most of them who are halfway saying, know this full well, incidentally. This isn't because of some establishment remain a sabotage of the Brexit process. It's because these were always fantasies produced by people who, at the point that they said this stuff, wouldn't have known a trade treaty if they'd met one in their soup. 
What we needed to do very early on, and this is not, I hope, sounding wise after the event, because I hope I was wise before the event. Um, what we needed to do early on was to recognise the complexity and inevitable longevity of the Brexit process, work out our viable options, achieve real clarity about where we wanted to land, and having worked through very honestly what the tough choices we faced were, and regrettably we still do face, are, and then reconcile ourselves to a very serious period of transition. And also to recognise that there could never, on the part of the remaining member states, be the appetite to have two very difficult negotiations with the UK, one to deliver a transitional bridging deal and the other to agree to an end state after exit. One such negotiation, as we are seeing, is quite enough for everyone. So transitional arrangements were always going to be off the shelf. Put bluntly, though, I'm afraid none of this happened. Instead, before much of the serious work to look at where we wanted to land post-exit had happened, we'd locked ourselves into a date certain for the invocation of Article 50. And that duly forfeited at a stroke any real UK leverage about how that process would run, and it gave to the 27, who by the morning of June the 24th, 2016, had already set out their no negotiation without notification of Article 50 position. It gave them the first couple of goals of the match in the opening five minutes. Now, all the people who are loudest now in bemoaning the Prime Minister's lousy deal were, of course, the loudest in cheering from the rafters when she made this fateful error. Many are hastily now rewriting history to claim they were always against it. They weren't, though. I do remember this quite well. One can't blame the 27 for playing it as they did. You can, I think, should blame the 27 for having had too few serious top-level discussions about how they see the relationship with the UK evolving after exit. But before the Prime Minister had ever turned up for her first ever leaders meeting, the combination of that decision to guarantee notification under Article 50 by a certain date and the red line substance of her first party conference leader speech had completely cemented the solidarity of the 27, which has held soundly ever since on how to kick off and how to design the sequencing of the Article 50 process. And that's led to where we are today. Now, anyone who understood the dynamic could read all that in the European Council conclusions in June and October and December of 2017, and in the words of key leaders through the autumn of 2016. The conference speech and the Lancaster House one which followed were a gift from heaven to those in the EU, who were many, concerned that the UK might be able to divide and rule and introduce internal tensions into the EU which would fragment their position. Those speeches were, of course, I don't want to be unkind largely for domestic consumption, but for the subsequent negotiation process, they were, as the saying goes, worse than a crime. They were a mistake. Uh, but in the total self-absorption of party conference world and Westminster world, no one was paying much attention to how the EU was patiently constructing a process designed to maximise its leverage. And even by April 2017, I'd long left by then, when the first set of so-called guidelines emerged from the leaders at 27, it was very hard to get here, anybody here to read them. We were, as usual, preoccupied with the endless noises from the noisy but largely irrelevant in Westminster, while the real work was being done on the other side of the channel. But those very expertly crafted guidelines of the leaders led completely inexorably to the December 2017 agreement, and the substance of that agreement led equally inexorably to all the elements of the deal now on the table which has caused all the furore. The battle on sequencing, which the then Brexit Secretary David Davis declared to be the battle of the summer of 2017, was actually long since lost by the time he started fighting it. Anyone who now expresses their outrage, and they're out there expressing their outrage a lot about the outcome only now, is either feigning the le their level of indignation, or they weren't paying attention 12, 18, 24 months ago. And because the UK had given no serious thought to the question of transitional arrangements until it was too late... By the time it did actually focus, London was urgently begging for what is now pejoratively termed the vassal state transition, precisely because it knew it couldn't be ready for the post-Brexit world, equ the post-Brexit equilibrium world by March 2019. All the EU therefore really had to do was to ensure that the, ha the transition hinged off a withdrawal treaty containing this permanent legal all-weather <coughs> backstop on the Irish border, and it knew that the UK had no alternative but to sign such a withdrawal agreement. No amount of bold but basically empty talk about no deal being better than a bad deal, which we heard endlessly from the government, however often they repeated it, made the slightest difference to the 27th assessment of the negotiating reality, 
which was that the UK needed more time and that failure to get it would be much worse for the UK than all the alternatives. Now, as I've said before in other lectures, I'm all for knowing what your best alternative to a negotiated deal, your so-called BAPNA, is in negotiations. You have to know in any negotiation whether you can walk out. And you have to be sure that you understand what could happen if you do walk out and what you can do to mitigate the downsides. But if you're actually emitting all sorts of signals which indicate that you know you cannot walk out, don't bluff. Because it makes you look weak, not strong, and it fools nobody. And those who were suckered into doing or cheering the wrong thing in the negotiation at the wrong time for the wrong reason, and duped themselves into thinking it would all be extraordinarily simple, can't acknowledge that, of course. So the narrative now, and I'm afraid you're seeing more and more of it, and it's dangerous, has to be of betrayal by a Remainer elite who sabotage the No Deal plans. It's the emerging British equivalent of the Dolstos legenda, the stab-in-the-back myth, which post the Versailles Treaty at the end of the First World War the German military, Hindenburg and others, propagated to blame the Weimar civilian elite for having betrayed a supposedly undefeated army. But the efficacy of no-deal preparations, which we're now hearing a lot more about, depends massively, again, as we're belatedly hearing a lot more about, on what others do, not just on what the UK does. So the lesson here, I think, and it's a brutal one, is we need much less self-absorption we need a vastly clearer, less self-deceiving understanding of the incentives and interests on the other side of the table. We need a less passive approach to the construction of the process. We need serious, serious substance, not plausible bullshit. <laughs> we already see in the withdrawal agreement the clear signs that having succeeded, basically, I'm afraid they have, with their negotiating plans in this phase, the EU will replete exactly the same clock and cliff edge technique in the run-up to the next UK general election, knowing that it can and will exact concessions as the deadline looms. Now, you can blame the EU, and I think I would, actually, for overdoing their success in ordering the whole, the whole negotiations. Although this has slightly the flavour of blaming Mo Salah for banging in a hat-trick and not stopping at two. Uh, has, has EU tactical negotiating acumen turned into a strategically myopic blunder because they've over-egged it and won the first leg too convincingly? Or can our brave lads recover in the second leg if only they're finally led by a boss who's got enough belief? Um, well, I think the football metaphors are probably best stopped there. Um, <laughs> except to say that I thought that the days when uh, the British press had persuaded themselves that we would just win a tournament if we could exhibit more passion than our opponents had got. It actually helps in a negotiation actually to know what you're doing and to be stone-cold sober about the interests of the other players around the table. My fourth lesson would be it's not possible or democratic to argue that there's only one Brexit destination that, that is true and legitimate and represents the revealed will of the people and that all other potential destinations outside the EU are Brexit in name only. The public voted in huge numbers, and we have to remember that, and the majority voted to leave and not to remain. That much is clear. The people were not asked to give their reasons for voting leave or remain, and they were multifarious, in my view, on both sides. For decades, some of the staunchest standard bearers for leaving the post-Maastricht Treaty EU made the case for staying in the so-called single market, remaining a signatory to the EEA agreement, European Economic Area Agreement, but leaving the institutions of political and juridical in integration of the Union. I spent years of my life reading Eurosceptic tomes, arguing that Maastricht, amplified by subsequent treaties, represented a wrong turn in European integration, and that what we needed to do was to return to the essentially mercantile ideas behind the internal market project and jettison UK adherence to the rest. And for many ordinary, I don't mean that patronisingly, people... I have talked to, especially outside the metropolitan elite circles who obsess about post-Brexit models, that sense of, we only ever joined a common market, but it's turned into something very different, and no one in authority down in London ever asked us whether that's what we wanted, that's actually probably the closest to capturing their reasons for voting leave. Now, you can't suddenly start denouncing such people as quizzling closet remainers who don't subscribe to the only true path Brexit. Uh, in an earlier lecture, I described Brexitism, and I think there is a Brexitism, as a revolutionary phenomenon which radicalised as time went on, 
and is now devouring its own children, and you're starting to see it devouring its own children. This current phase feels more like Maoists trying to crush rightist deviationists than it does British conservatism. To be clear, this is not, and I'm not making here an argument for the EEA model as opposed to the current proposed deal. I've no, no time in this lecture to try and rehearse the arguments for either. I have plenty of reservations, actually, about the UK uh, going for an EEA-type model, uh, all of which date from my Treasury days. I have just as many reservations with the proposal on the table. But I also deplore the way which, in which the substance of all these models is completely distorted by people who don't actually understand them. That's both opponents and proponents. And have given them a few days thought in a panic because they're now in a political crisis. But my real objection here is to the style of argument espoused by both pro-no-deal right and by Downing Street, which says that no other model but their own is a potentially legitimate interpretation of the will of the people which evidently only they can properly discern. As for the Prime Minister's proposed model, the entire EU knows that where we've now reached derives from her putting the ending of free movement of people well above all other objectives and privileging as near as possible frictionless trade in goods as she can get over the interests of UK services sectors. They're pretty unsurprised by the former on free movement, but they're surprised, sometimes gleefully, to be honest, by the latter, as it seems to point to precisely a deal skewed in their favour rather than ours. We've essentially sacrificed all ambition on services sectors in return for ending free movement of people, sold the latter, the ending of free movement, as a boon, when, amongst other things, it devalues having a UK passport, and presented the former as the regaining of sovereignty, when actually what it does is guarantee the loss, major loss of market access in much our largest export market. Well, by all means, argue for that. I'm not against arguing for that. There's a case for it. I fully accept that the control of borders, albeit with much confusion about the bit we already have control over, but year after year fail under this government to ever, ever achieve control of, was a central referendum issue. Of course it was a central referendum issue. But please don't argue that it's the only feasible Brexit or that it's an economically rational one. Of course the EU side will now back the Prime Minister in saying this is the only answer, this is the only deal on the table, we'll never negotiate anything else. They've done a great deal for themselves and they want it to stick. Who can blame them? But it's not real to say it's the emanation of the will of the people and no other deal is viable. Fifth lesson... If WTO terms or existing EU preferential trade deals are not good enough for the UK in major third country markets, they can't be good enough for trade with our largest market, the EU. You cannot simultaneously argue that it's perfectly fine to leave a deep free, free trade agreement with easily our largest export and import market for the next generation and trade on WTO terms. <laughs> You hear this endlessly from all the Brexiteers because that's how we and others trade with everyone else. And at the same time argue that it's imperative we get out of the EU in order that we can strike preferential trade deals with large parts of the rest of the world because the existing terms on which we trade with the rest of the world are intolerable. I mean, if moving beyond WTO terms with major markets represents a major step forward in liberalising trade, then deliberately moving back to WTO terms from an existing deep preferential trade agreement, which is what the single market is, represents a major <coughs> step backward from free trade. You really can't have it both ways. Well, when I say you cannot argue this, many clearly can and do, but it's beyond incoherent, it's charlatanry. It's fine and legitimate to argue, especially in the current obvious absence of any ability to drive forward major multilateral trade liberalisation at a time when the US has manifestly deserted the field and ceased to be interested in it, and may indeed be about setting about deliberalising trade and undermining the World Trade Organisation and regretting having allowed China into the World Trade Organisation, it's perfectly legitimate then to say the UK must aim at a global lattice work of bilateral and plurilateral free trade deals. I think I probably would. It's equally legitimate to argue, as I mentioned earlier, that you only want free trade deals which stop well short of the intrusion on national sovereignty, which single market harmonisation, mutual recognition via supranational legislation, adjudication and enforcement uh, entails. 
But this is why our current debate on sovereignty and taking back control is often so frankly bizarre. It's just comical, really, at the moment, listening to right-wing populist politicians claiming they are avid free traders and simultaneously saying that one of the purposes of taking back control is to be able to rig domestic markets and competitions in favour of British suppliers and producers. Now, protectionism is always somebody else's sin, of course, and the Tory party has been through these decades-long spasms before. Joseph Chamberlain, in the early 20th century, in tariff reform, imperial preference campaign, was as loudly pious, nationalist, probably imperialist, and messianic as many on the right today. And that led all the way through to his son, Neville Chamberlain's protectionist legislation in the early 1930s, which helped worsen a post-financial crisis economy. Sound familiar? Uh, a post-Brexit Britain which is committed to openness and free trade, which I hope we would be, will need, first of all, to run very hard to stand still because two-thirds of UK exports are either to the EU or to countries with whom the EU has a preferential deal, which we shall, first of all, have to try and roll over unchanged. Market access into the EU will worsen whatever post-Brexit deal we eventually strike. And the quantum by which our trade flows with the EU will diminish, and that impacts immediately, because it's immediate market closing, will outweigh the economic impact of greater market opening, which we have to aim to achieve in other t over time in other third country markets, where the impact, I'm afraid, will not be immediate, but will be incremental and progressive and pretty gradual. As the country debates its future trade policy in the next stage of negotiations, both with the EU and with the sizable market, outside the EU, it does need honesty from politicians that trade agreements take a long time, that even if every one we aspired to were completed, that will actually, I'm afraid, have a very modest impact on overall UK economic performance, and that every version of Brexit involves a worsening of the UK's trade position and a loss of market access to its largest market. And as we strive to limit the extent of that worsening, which is always described as defeatism and, you know, Mandarin insiders, uh, you know, viewing Brexit as a damage limitation, public debate will actually, I'm afraid, have to get serious about what the real trade-offs are, because the EU will be quite brutal in the next few years in teaching us what the trade-offs are. Sixth lesson. The huge problem for the UK with either reversion to WTO terms or with a standard free trade deal with the EU is services. Now, this is perhaps less a lesson of the last two and a half years than the curious case of the dog that's largely failed to bark. But it will bark in the next few years, I guarantee you. And again, the public needs to be aware of the big trade-offs that are coming because resentment when the next set of climb-downs begin and I can probably name the date when the next set of climb-downs begins, will be off the scale, unless you prepare the public for the trade-offs that are coming. So far, both during the referendum and since, the trade debate has been dominated politically by trading goods, tariffs issues, and some discussion of the impact on manufacturing supply chains of departing the single market and customs union. Now, again, I don't want to be excessively unkind here, but politicians find goods trade and tariffs more graspable than services trade and the huge complexities of non-tariff barriers in services sectors. They rarely grasp the extent to which goods and services are bundled together and are indissociable. They even more rarely grasp how incredibly tough it is to deliver freer cross-border trade in services, which by definition gets you deep into sovereignty questions in a way which makes removing tariff barriers really look like a bit of a picnic. As the Prime Minister has gradually backed away, and she has backed away from her original red lines in her October 2016 party conference speech, as she realised she would imperil large tracts of UK manufacturing if she persisted with those red lines, the position softened on quasi-customs union propositions. Hence, of course, the co constant howls of betrayal from those who thought that October 2016 and the Lancaster House speech, which I'm afraid to say I think were both bad speeches, uh, the howls of outrage from those who thought that those were the speeches that marked, mapped the only true path to the only true Brexit. Her only way to seek to sell this politically, and let's be candid, so far with very little sign of success in her own party, was to talk boldly about greater autonomy and divergence in services regulation. Now, the reality, as I say, is that UK services industry's needs have largely been sacrificed to the primary goal of ending free movement of people. 
and post-exit, and post the end of any transitional arrangement, it's UK services exports who will, exporters who will face the starkest worsening of trade terms because of the substantial difference between how far services trade is liberalised under even the highly imperfect European services single market and the very best that is achievable under any other form of free trade or regional agreement on the planet. Yet it's in services sectors where we currently have a very sizable trade surplus with the EU, whereas it's in manufactured goods where we have a huge deficit. But the extent and type of cross-border free trade that exists in the single market ceases when you leave the single market. A very large proportion of cross-border services trade conducted outside the single market only happens because firms have offices physically established in the countries to which they're exported. So we know already, I'm afraid, that cross-border supply of services will diminish pretty radically post-Brexit, and that the ease of establishment of legal entities and ambitious deals on temporary free movement of workers and on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications will actually be central for us to try and sustain trade flows in what will be much colder conditions to limit the impact on the UK economy. But there will be a substantial hit in the end on the balance of trade and on the public finances because there will be significant relocations out of the UK's jurisdiction of major firms. Because we've rendered the best mode of supplying services across borders far harder by leaving the European Union. Now, these implications are obvious. I mean, I shouldn't need to say them, but one does need to say them repeatedly within Whitehall and into the political debate, and most people are not listening to them. Again, the public isn't being told of them, because the fiction has to be maintained, at least until a first deal is done, if it is, that there'll be no sort of preferential free movement terms for EU citizens. So we stagger on, and stagger seems the operative word, constantly postponing the long-promised white paper on immigration post-Brexit, and after it eventually gets published, it's been postponed five times, I think, so far, we know that in reality, once the free trade agreement negotiations get underway and reality bites on the UK side, the policy, like so many others in the last 30 months, will simply disintegrate in the face of negotiating imperatives of the free trade agreement. The EU already knows that the UK will, under whichever Prime Minister, be prepared to pay a heavy price to maintain better access to business services, legal services, consultancy, financial services, tertiary education services than other third country countries have in the EU market uh, via the standard free trade agreements they've got. Why? Because that's an economic imperative for a country like ours which has a world, world class services capability but needs market access to its largest local market. That EU leverage will be deployed in the years ahead and it will be used to enforce deals on issues like fisheries on which, again, referendum campaign commitments will be abandoned in the teeth of reality. That's the political reality we face. Those saying that now, like me, will, of course, get ritual denunciations for defeatism and lack of belief and treachery and whatever else. But give it two more years. Give it two. The Brexiteers, the strength of whose case to the public has always resided, and there was a strength in the case, in saying to the public that the le their leaders had misled them and missold them as to what the EU was becoming, have now done their own mis-selling job. And they're in the middle of a painful process of discovering that as trade terms worsen for the UK on exit, which they denied would happen, they will, under economic duress during the trade negotiations, have to let down the very communities to whom they promised the earth in terms of a post-Brexit dividend. Now, that penny is dropping. It's pretty painful and it's pretty slow, but the penny is dropping. And that is a key lesson. But the key lesson, again, is be honest and be transparent with the public about the very difficult choices ahead. Seventh lesson, <coughs> beware all supposed deals bearing pluses. <laughs> the pluses in all the deals that you're reading about in the press merely signify that all the deficiencies in the name deal will miraculously disappear when we Brits come to negotiate our own version of it. As the scale of the humiliation they do think the Prime Minister's proposed deal <coughs> delivers started in the Conservative Party far too late to dawn on those politicians who thought really that Brexit was a cakewalk with the emphasis on the word cake, uh, we've seen a proliferation of mostly half-baked cake alternatives emerge. They all carry at least one plus. Canada's acquired several. Uh, 
besides Canada plus 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 or super Canada as I think uh, Boris Johnson called it uh, or super califragilistic Canada as I believe uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg called it uh, we have Norway plus which used to be called Norway then Canada then became Norway for now and has now become Norway plus forever and now we have no deal plus which also makes appearances as managed no deal and even no deal mini deals now What's depressing about this nomenclature, apart from it being impenetrable, is the sheer dishonesty of it. The pluses are inserted to enable one to say that one's well aware of why existing free trade agreement or economic area deal A or B doesn't really work for the UK as a Brexit destination, but with the additions that you're proposing, the template will be fantastic. Um, we even have the wonderfully preposterous sight of, of ex-Brexit secretaries alleging that the very Canada Plus deal that they want has already been offered by Presidents Tusk and Juncker and that all that needs doing is to write this in as the destination in the political declaration. But let me tell you, as someone dealing at the outset of this process with both Presidents Tusk and Juncker and their staffs, what the EU institutions mean by Canada Plus is not remotely what the ex-Brexit and Foreign Secretaries and the Institute of Economic Affairs scribes mean by Canada Plus. The title page is the same. Uh, the contents pages are rather different. Now, No Deal Plus is brought to us courtesy of the very people who told us that a great free trade deal would be struck before we even left because of the mercantile interests of the key manufacturing players around the continent in key member states would prevail against the pettifogging, legalistic, ivory tower instincts of the Brussels Ayatollahs. Well, forgive me for pointing out, as some of us forecast well over two years ago, when within the system, it didn't actually turn out quite like that. And not a peep was heard from the titans of corporate Europe, except to back very robustly the position of their capitals that the continued integrity of the single market project was vastly more important to them than the terms of a framework agreement with the UK, a position which I'm afraid will not change in the trade negotiations ahead either. The No Deal Plus fantasy, you're going to hear a lot more about it in coming weeks, I suspect, is that if we just had the guts to walk away, refuse to sign the withdrawal agreement with the backstop in it, withhold a good half of the money that the Prime Minister promised this time last year, capitals, suddenly realising that we were serious, would come running for a whole series of mini-deals which assured full trading continuity in all key sectors on basically unchanged single market and customs union terms. Uh, I don't know what tablets these people are taking, but I, I, I must confess I wish I were on them. Um, it will be said of them, I think, as it was said of the Bourbons, they've learned nothing and they've forgotten nothing. The reality is that if a deal on the table falls apart, and it may, because we've said no, there will not be some smooth, rapid suite of mini side deals from aviation to fisheries, from road haulage to data, from derivatives to customs and veterinary checks, from medicines to financial services, as the EU affably sits down with this Prime Minister or another one and says, oh, what do you really want? The 27 will legislate and institute unilaterally temporary arrangements which ensure continuity where they need it, which is in plenty of places, and cause us asymmetrical difficulties where they can. And the UK government, which knows the efficacy of most of its own contingency planning, of which there's loads, depends to a greater or lesser degree on others' actions out of its control, will then have to react, no doubt with a mixture of inevitable compliance with the world dictated by the 27, and bellicose retaliation. Now, we already see the next generation of fantasies out there, and it's now just a matter of time, I'm afraid, before a Tory leadership contender, if we get a Tory leadership uh, election uh, sooner rather than later, offers them publicly as a Houdini Act. As I say, a suite of very rapid legal mini-deals accompanied by the existing withdrawal agreement deal on citizens' rights, the complete dropping of the backstop, and only paying the remainder of the 39 billion check when the mini-deals have turned into the miraculous Canada deal, plus loads of pluses, all of which has got to happen in a few months, but of course. To which the EU answer will be the usual calm but clear dream on. Um, you want a transition? All existing terms and conditions apply, including the backstop. And when it comes to any free trade agreement, deep or shallower, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, and that still includes the fish. Um, they may, they more, may put it slightly more politely, although given the mood in capitals I think of it, about London at the moment, I don't think it'll be that polite. If we lurch, despite Parliament 
clearly wishing to avoid it, and obviously the vast majority of the House of Commons is against a no-deal. But if we lurch, and we may still lurch towards no-deal, because the default in this negotiation is no-deal. If there is no majority in the Commons for anything, we will end up with no-deal. If we lurch towards no-deal with delusions it can be managed into a quick and dirty free trade agreement, I'm afraid that will not end happily or quickly. Now, I'm in no position to second-guess what the Treasury or the Bank of England have said and those who try and model the macro effects of such a scenario. Let's be clear, no developed country in the world has ever left a trade block before, let alone in disorderly fashion, and let alone a trade block which has become a lot more than a trade block. So we don't know what will happen, but one can have expectations. But I do understand fully, I'm afraid, the legal realities. And because the so-called WTO rules deliver precisely no continuity in multiple key sectors of the economy, we could expect disruption on a scale and of a length that no one, in my view, has experienced in the developed world in the last couple of generations. Now, the complacency <coughs> that we hear from politicians all the time that such things cannot and would not ever really happen in modern economies is just staggering. Now, markets continue to react, or they have until this week, and there have been wobbles this week, as if something must turn up and that no deal is a virtually unimaginable scenario for politicians professing to be serious to contemplate. And that risk has therefore, in my view, been underpriced for a year or more because we're dealing, if I can be very candid, and this is not just in the UK, with a political ge generation which has no serious experience of bad times and is frankly cavalier about precipitating events which they couldn't then control but they do feel they could exploit. And Nothing is, I'm afraid, more redolent of the pre-First World War era when very few believed that a very, very long period of European police peace and equilibrium could be shattered in a matter of months. But it was. Eighth lesson. You cannot and should not want to conduct a huge negotiation of this sort as untransparently as the UK has. And in the end, it does you no good to try. At virtually every stage in this negotiation so far, the EU has deployed transparency, whether on its position papers, its graphic presentations of its take on viable options and parameters, its no-deal notices to the private sector to dictate the terms of the debate and shape the outcome. A secretive, opaque British government, hampered, of course, in fairness, by being permanently divided against itself and therefore largely unable to articulate any agreed, coherent position, has floundered in the EU's wake. It's an unusual experience for the EU, if, to be honest, because it's always portrayed as a bunch of wildly out-of-touch technocrats producing turgid, jargon-ridden, Eurocrat prose up against genuine politicians who speak the human language. Um, so it's a very unusual experience for the EU to win propaganda battles, let alone them win them as easily as they have over the last two years. But in fairness, the EU has had bruising experiences over recent decades, and it's had to cope with demands for vastly greater transparency in its conduct of trade policy, and trade policy has moved. I used to do trade policy in the 1990s. It's moved from being a theatre of technocrat nerds to being the hottest topic on the planet, uh, not least because of Donald Trump. Precisely, as I say, because trade negotiations cut to the heart of sovereignty and identity questions as soon as they encroach on domestic regulation. So that's forced Brussels to up its game, and it's thought more about transparency on trade deals than the UK side has. The battle for free trade policies, I'm a great avid free trader myself, it's always been difficult in both EU and US, and it's difficult in Japan, and difficult in every <coughs> developed economy. In the US, it's after all gone convincingly backwards in both major parties over the last 20 years. I'm tempted to say it's only much of the Tory Eurosceptic Americanophile establishment which appears not to have noticed that, or not to have taken in the reality of it. Now, to be clear, this is not an argument that by applying the lipstick to the pig of the Chequers proposal, or the proposed deal now on the table, the course of history would all have been changed. You can't redeem a bad deal by advertising it slickly on Facebook. But the <laughs> negotiation process politically and in and beyond Parliament has to be different, had to be different from the outset, and it'll have to be different at the next stage. You can't possibly run one of the largest and most complex trade negotiations on the planet and leave most insiders, let alone most of the public, completely in the dark about the difficult choices we face. Now, at extremely sensitive phases of negotiations, and I've done loads of negotiations over the last 25, 30 years, negotiators, of course, have to disappear into the so-called tunnel to have any safe space in which to explore potential landing zones. That's completely inevitable. 
But this government has repeatedly, completely failed to explain to a wider audience what the real constraints and trade-offs are in arriving at the sort of landing zone the Prime Minister herself views as some combination of desirable and unavoidable. That, again, is a lesson, I'm afraid, for the next stage of the negotiation that the government has to learn. And the ninth and final lesson builds on that. Real honesty with the public is the best, and indeed now I think the only policy, if we're to get to the other side of Brexit with a healthy democracy, a reasonably unified country, which is going to be difficult, and a healthy economy, which is also going to be difficult. The, the debate in the last 30 months in this country has suffered from opacity, delusion-mongering, and, let's be honest, mendacity on all sides. The Prime Minister's call for opponents of her deal to be honest, she said in the House of Commons, and not simply wish away intractable problems like the backstop, which was and always will remain a central question in the resolution of the Brexit issue. That's actually a perfectly reasonable call to make. I've talked briefly already of the extraordinary cakeism in the various options on the table. And at the extremes, we have no dealers quite happy to jump off the cliff lying openly about the extent to which the WTO rules provide a safety net if we did, and producing, as I say, fantasy managed no-deal options which won't fly for the reasons I set out. And the people's voters, I confess I deplore the term people's vote, they want a second referendum with remain on the ballot. A case you can make, given the dismal place we've now ended up, and given possible, maybe likely, parliamentary paralysis, but they must surely understand the huge further alienation that might well engender amongst those who think that yet again their views have just been ignored until they bring them into conformity with what the metropolitan elite wants. Beyond that, even yesterday morning, I listened to a shadow cabinet member promising, with a straight face, uh, it seemed, that after a general election, there would be time for Labour, after a general election, mind you, there would be time for Labour to negotiate a completely different deal, including a full trade deal, which would replicate all the advantages of the single market and customs union, and all before March the 30th, 2019. Uh, I assume they haven't stopped laughing yet in Brussels. <laughs> Too much of our political debate just insults people's intelligence and just suggests that every facet of Brexit you don't like is purely a feature of the Prime Minister's deal and her version of Brexit rather than intrinsic to the process of leaving. I dislike plenty of the Prime Minister's deal. It's obviously quite a bad deal. But given her own views and preferences, her bitterly divided party and the negotiating realities with the other side of the table, I can at least understand why she's ended up there and she's ended up in pretty much the only landing zone she could ever have reached. Those aspiring to a radically different landing zone owe us some honest accounts, not pipe dreams of how they propose to get there and the timescale over which they will. But the dishonesty of the debate has, I'm afraid, been fuelled by government for the last two and a half years. It took ages before grudging recognition was given to the reality that no trade deal, even an embryonic one, would be struck before exit, and that no trade deals with other players would be in place either. Even now, the Prime Minister talks publicly about the political declaration document as if it defined the future relationship with some degree of precision and defined it largely in line with her own Chequers proposal, when it simply does neither. It's actually vague to the point of vacuity in many places, strewn with adjectives, always bad sign in the European document, um, and studiously ambiguous in a way that enables it to be sold as offering all things to all people without committing anyone fully to anything. Pretty clever, sensible sort of document to produce when we're in this sort of mess. For the same reason, the desperate inability to acknowledge that it was going to take many years to get to the other side of the Brexit process, we've had the bizarre euphemism from the Prime Minister of the implementation period after March 2019, when there is precisely nothing to implement and precisely everything still to negotiate. I, I mean, I dislike the vassal state terminology and the people who produced it, but anyone can see that there is a serious democratic problem with being subject to laws made in rooms where no Brit was present and living under a court's jurisdiction where there's no British judge. And now, if we're to avoid the backstop coming into force, you know, the, uh, the core of the issue that we now face in whether this deal passes or not, we're going to end up prolonging that transition because the free trade agreement won't be done by the end of 2020. I was saying that more than two years ago. And the EU very well knows that the UK won't jump off a cliff in the run-up to the next UK general election. 
We've had also the several bizarre contortions over trying to invent a customs proposal which would enable us to escape the common external tariff of the European Union but still derive all the advantages of a quasi-customs union. Even the all-UK backstop proposal that the Prime Minister ended up producing has ended up being called a temporary customs arrangement when we all know it to be a temporary union as nothing else could fly under WTO rules. But the U word is too toxic for polite Conservative company, evidently. On the backstop itself, it was obvious reading the December 2017 agreement document from outside government that this must lead inexorably to where we've now reached. There was no other end game from that point. That was why a year ago, when I, I started telling city firms and corporates that they were seriously underestimating the chances of a no-deal outcome. But what we got, I'm afraid, was sophistry, evasions, euphemisms, and sometimes straight denials at home. Whilst in the EU, the Prime Minister and several senior ministers several times appeared to be backsliding on clear political commitments as soon as they saw draft legal texts giving effect to agreements they'd already struck. That deepened the distrust, <coughs> and if anything, hardened the EU's resolve to nail the issue down completely legally. And from the apoplectic reaction uh, and the benches and the commons to the Attorney General's advice, which elegantly stated the totally bleed and obvious, you can now see why. Whether this deal staggers with some clarification across the line in the next several weeks, and we go into the next phase with the cards rather stacked against us, as I've described, or whether we have a new Prime Minister who attempts to reset direction, but will find, as I say, that whatever reset they attempt Rather, a lot of the negotiating dynamics and parameters remain completely unchanged. I don't know. But either way, I think my final lesson is that we shall need some radically different method and style in our domestic debate if the country is to heal and unify behind some proposed destination. And that requires leadership, which is far more honest in setting out the fundamental choices still ahead. The difficult trade-offs between sovereignty and national control and keeping market access for our goods and services in our biggest market, and which sets out at least to try and build some viable consensus across a bitterly divided country. So I'd like to end with a quote which seems to me to be particularly appropriate on this day of all days and right at this time. The famous speech is made by a king who has gained power, still holds it, but his enemies are now openly attacking him. He can no longer find the meaning in the success he's won, or even in life itself. In a compelling image, he speaks of life, and in particular the part he played in life as a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his time upon the stage. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. The time to lose ourselves in these stories has ended, in my view. Our politicians can no longer get away with strutting and fretting, or with sound and fury. It's time for them to wake up from the dream and face the facts. Thank you.